good afternoon to you all. While well, toric errors have becoming the standard of care for patients with pre-existing corneal astigmatism who undergo cataract surgery. However, the results following their implantation are not always predictable. Corneal astigmatism measurements, surgically induced astigmatism, and the methods of calculations are all factors that might contribute to unexpected residual astigmatism. So let's start with corneal astigmatism measurements. While there are many devices in the market that use different technologies to measure the corneal astigmatism, most of them are based on anterior corneal measurements, but some can measure the posterior cornea as well. And furthermore, not all of them are measuring in the same location, and some will have better repeatability and accuracy than others, so it is important to be familiar with your devices and to know their strengths and weaknesses. Now, it's also important to be critical when evaluating our measurements and not to fly on automatic pilot mode. So useful validations criteria are available on Wernhill's website. Now, before we determine the corneal astigmatic power and meridian, it is best to assure that we are dealing with a symmetrical and regular astigmatism, and then it is advisable to follow Warren Hill's methodology by using primary and secondary supporting instruments to determine the steep meridian and to go for the same process for the power difference between the meridians. Now, for our uh, primary device, we would like to use the best machine available, the most accurate one. And as we all know, good repeatability is essential for high accuracy. So here are double angle plots of the differences in the measured corneal astigmatism of healthy volunteers one week apart, taken either by the IL Master 500 or the Lenstar. And um, in a perfect world, all these dots should be plotted against the zero mark since we are measuring the same eyes, differences of the same eyes. But as you can see, this is not the case for both devices. However, the Lenstar had a significantly lower variance as compared to the IL Master. And the differences between the two measurements were uh, below 0.5 diopters in more than 96% of the eye using the lens star, as opposed to only 78% with the owl master. Now what about accuracy? So here are the errors in predicted residual astigmatism following Tori Carroll implantation. And as you can see here, the lens star had a significantly lower centroid prediction errors and variance as compared to the owl master. Now, another reason why the lens tower is one of my favorite devices for measuring the corneal astigmatism is that it's not just a black box in which you just press buttons, get numbers, and hope for the best. Rather, you can click on the keratometry measurement area, and you can actually evaluate the quality of your measurement going one by one, even after the patient has long gone from your clinic. So you can go quickly through the measurements, and then you can delete the ones that you do not like, and then you get a new average and standard deviation for the flat K, for the steep K, and for the steep meridian, which I find it quite reassuring. Now, the next issue that I would like to talk about is surgically induced astigmatism. Well, this is a highly controversial issue, and unfortunately, I'm not going to give you here the right answers. Rather, I want to share with you some of my thoughts and dilemmas. <coughs> so many of us tend just to use 0.5 diopters for our SIA, uh, just arbitrarily. And the question is, is it acceptable? Maybe we should use a quarter of the after instead, or maybe even zero. What about our incision location? Should we just use our routine location? Or maybe we should go on axis, like some advise us to do, even if it is ridiculously uncomfortable. So the first problem with the SAA is that the mean SAA is not calculated as a vector. And as we all know, astigmatism is a vector, and a vector has both magnitude and direction. So this is the traditional way of how we calculate the SIA. So for a single eye, the SIA is done properly using proper vector math. However, for the mean SIA, it takes only the mean of the magnitudes, neglecting its meridians. So what we get in this way is actually a mean absolute value and not a mean vector value, which is also termed the centroid. And they are not equivalent, as you'll see in the next slide. So here are the SIA. Uh, values um, derived from 127 eyes of a single highly experienced surgeon who used 2.4 uh, millimeters of clear corneal incision in a temporal approach. And as you can see here, the mean absolute values are around 0.4 diopters. However, the centroid values are considerably lower, 0.15 and 0.12 diopters for the right and left eye respectively. And these differences are clinically significant because they can easily alter the toric power that we would choose for our patients. Now, the next issue is the limited repeatability of our measuring devices. 
Now, I would like to show you again the double angle plots of the differences in the uh, measurements of the corneal astigmatism of healthy volunteer one week apart. Now, um, and let's do a theoretical exercise. Okay, so let's uh, calculate now the mean SIA, same as we do for the traditional SIA calculation, and we'll get the pseudo SIA, which should be zero, right? Because we didn't even touch these corneas. So for the owl master, we get a pseudo SIA of 0.35 diopters, and for the lens star, 0.18 diopters. So we have an SIA without even touching the cornea. So this factitious SIA is a result of the noise that we have in this sort of measurements. However, if we use the centroid values, the SIA is zero as it should be. Another issue is case-to-case -case variability. Um, and the last thing that I would like to talk about is the post-op measurements. Now, we usually take our post-op measurement one month following the surgery, but what will be the SIA effect at six months or even one year? I don't know the answer for that. So my recommendation to you is if you are up to it, uh, try to calculate your personal SIA. You can use uh, Warren Hill's uh, SIA online calculator and click on the central, centroid value option. And in the meanwhile, I think it's reasonable to use a low SIA value between 0 and 0.2 diopters uh, if you use a clear coronal incisions of 2.4 millimeters or below that. Now, my personal uh, way of doing that, I'm, I'm just going uh, with a temporal approach and I use an SIA value of 0 and I don't bother to go on axis anymore. Now, the last topic is the method of calculations. Now, today we all know that standard keratometry and topography machine tend to yield inaccurate results in assessing the net corneal astigmatic power. Now, it's been more than four years since Doug Code had reminded us the role of the posterior cornea for toric-aural calculations, and the next obvious step is to try to figure out how we sh should use this knowledge in our daily practice. So one option is to use intraoperative aberrometry. Another option is to use toric-aural calculations uh, with the correction formulas like the nom nomograms like Baylor, correction formulas like the Abu Rafia Coke, or direct measurements of the posterior cornea. Now a third option is to use the baratory calculator. Now the full version of the toric calculator is available online as well as on the LensStar device. This is an all-in-one solution and it's based on the Universal 2 formula and it has an integral solution which takes into account both the effective lens position and a mathematical model which calculates uh, the estimated net corneal astigmatism by utilizing anterior corneal based measurements. Now I want to share with you some of our outcomes from one of our recent papers and in which we compare the accuracy of different methods to measure and predict the post-op astigmatism with toric aral implantation. So this was a retrospective study and it included patients who had uneventful cataract extraction with the toric aral implantation. And for the measuring devices, we compared the Master 500 LensStar and the Atlas topographer, and for the methods of calculation, we compared the Alcon, the Holiday, and the Baratory calculators. And what we found was that the combination of the LensStar with the Baratory calculator yielded the highest proportion of eyes with a prediction error below or equal 0 0.5, 0 0.75, and 1 diopter. Now, when we used the Alcon Toric calculator, both devices yielded against the rule prediction errors with a centroid of more than 0 0.5 diopters. Similar results were noted for the holiday toric calculator. However, well, by using the baratory calculator, it yielded the lowest central prediction errors, which were close to zero. So in summary, the outcomes of toric aerial implantation can be optimized by using appropriate measuring devices and appropriate methods of calculation. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Some questions? Okay. Um, I, I have one question. So everybody here in the room is now going to be using the Barrett Torah calculator. If they don't have the time to calculate their centroid value, what one number should they put in the Barrett Torah calculator? Well, I know that the, uh, Dr. Barrett's uh, um, recommendation is to put 0.1. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that the zero is also acceptable, but, you know, it's, um, I think it's, it's fine to to go for zeros, it's fine to go to 0 0.1. Ma maybe uh, mathematically uh, speaking, uh, 0 0.1 is the most accurate uh, value. Okay, and the, the point is not to put in 0 0.5 or 0 0.4, because I think that would probably be inaccurate. Any questions from the audience for Dr. Avulafia about optimizing toric outcomes? Okay, well, thank you, Adi.